going to try and be telegraphic and not um, get lost in different thoughts. Maria Arena, now a proposal on a table for an ad hoc tribunal for Ukraine. Uh, you asked me whether there is one or not. I'm not going to talk about whether there's a need. Uh, we don't. We have condemned uh, Russia's aggression. We are collecting evidence or helping to collect evidence. Uh, I'm not aware of any specific proposal on the table to set up an ad hoc tribunal. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it, but as far as I know, there isn't a proposal. Now, on the Taliban and the fact that they are not letting girls go to school, as you know, I was in Doha, you know this is... Uh, a, pr a place, a privileged place, which brings together the Taliban and the West. That's where the negotiations with the U.S. took place. And uh, we are also involved there. And we would like a special meeting in order to deal with these issues. The Doha Prize was given to the Afghan leader... Um, who's been very much involved in order to improve uh, young girls' access to education. We There was such despair. We didn't expect this decision taken by the Taliban. In fact, they said that they were opening up schools to women and young girls. So they went to school the first day, and then the second day they were told to go back home. So this is a terrible blow to the expectations, uh, the expectations that we still had left and that the Taliban could really respect the benchmarks that we laid down in Slovenia in order to make sure that there could be cooperation and that we could come closer together. It's a tragedy. Before I came here, I tried to issue a statement on this very issue this is basic violation of the right to education, the violation of human rights, and we condemn this in the harshest terms. But at the moment, there isn't much we can do, but what we can do is to say the following, because it's not just about stopping girls from going to school, it's about a more inclusive policy, which isn't happening. So if this doesn't happen, we can tell them if this doesn't happen, then we cannot make any headway with providing uh, more uh, assistance to the population through the Taliban government. At this meeting, the chairman of the International Red Cross was present. On the one hand, we have the feeling that the Afghan people need assistance because the economic and human situation is dreadful. But on the other, we cannot work with this government if this government continues um, moving away from the parameters that we felt were extremely important for them to be considered a counterpart. Uh, so this puts us in a very tricky situation. We have to continue mobilizing international organizations and NGOs to channel assistance. But this is extremely bad news for the future of Afghanistan, and we're going to have to say how we calibrate our attitude towards them. Now, on forced labor, you know that we are working on communications on due diligence. So this is about European businesses and their due diligence in order to make sure that their supply chains um, fulfill or uh, respect the rights that we say we defend because sometimes we find ourselves criticizing certain governments where what is happening and they turn to me and say, have you asked yourselves what European businesses are doing? And when they say that these things are happening. They are happening in uh, centers of production where you have, where you can bring influence to bear. So this is the issue of forced labor, more or less, because like everything in life, there are different degrees and 
of forced labour, but we are working on a set of communications and I hope that these will lead to legal instruments that our European businesses will have to respect. Now to Nathalie Loiseau, thank you very much for your constant support and for your help to make sure that the strategic compass saw the light of day. But as you said, now we have to implement it. And now we will have to uh, prove um, how we can uh, make this a reality. Now we have to strengthen defence and the, the defence capabilities of the EU. Now, Manu Pineda, this doesn't mean that the EU is going down a, a path of... Um, military uh, of a military approach it's about helping the eu member states the eu doesn't have and isn't going to have an army the armies will be instruments and capabilities of the member states but instead of having 27 different capabilities that aren't coordinated that ha have overlaps and uh, serious gaps and shortcomings we want to see whether we can be more able to tackle the challenges that are coming our way whether we like it or not uh, this is the goal of European defence policy and that's what we want to do with the strategic compass and this uh, analysis in order to pinpoint the gaps in defence capabilities. Uh, it's the European Defence Agency, among others, that have been commissioned to do. But uh, yes, they have been done. Um, all you have to do is go and read the publications of the European Defence Agency in order to see what we already know. And we know a lot about the gaps. And when I say gaps, I mean really what is lacking, what we don't have uh, when it comes to military capabilities, despite the expenditure, despite the spending. So we're going to have to see how we can plug the holes. Uh, and will this have an effect on the defense interest? Yes, of course. Uh, if someone wants to have some minimum autonomy, then it has to have a defense industry. Um, are we going to have to import our defense capabilities from other countries? Did you see what happened with paracetamol? Look at what happened with paracetamol. It would be a lot more serious if it weren't something like aspirin lacking, but basic defense capability. I think that the EU has to really become aware of the world that it lives in and not just take uh, some uh, position that believes that uh, showing a good example is enough to change the world. There are, there are, we live in a world with people who aren't very sensitive to these arguments. And I think that perhaps we have to come up with slightly stronger arguments with a bit more muscle. Uh, I think the Russian attack in Ukraine... Do you really think that Russia invaded Ukraine because Europe wants to increase its defense capabilities? So it's about Mr. Putin's regime and uh, his approach. And I think that we have to really become aware of what's happening and act accordingly. So... Sí, es verdad que seguimos about working in silos. Well, it's difficult not to work in silos when you have uh, two pillars, uh, the community and the government one uh, in our structure. The government one is made up of the member states and competencies are distributed in a sort of continuum, uh, defense, foreign affairs, foreign policy, etc. Defense is concentrated in the member states because we're not talking, and I repeat, we're not talking about a, creating a European army or replacing NATO with a European army. No, we should supplement what NATO does and be more efficient when it comes to how our armed forces operate. We've used the European peace facility to arm Ukraine, a country at war. Well, that's not what we had thought it was for. That's not what we created it for. When it was created, we had created it to strengthen the military capacity of our partners. Our partners uh, to strengthen their defense capacity. 
low-intensity ones. So we've trained soldiers in Chad, Niger, Mali, Mozambique now. We have uh, 18 missions throughout the world. Uh, so we we want to strengthen those armies of the countries with which we have, uh, which we cooperate. We want to strengthen the armies uh, and arm them uh, as far as possible. But we hadn't thought of doing that with Ukraine. But look at what the situation is. The situation is what it is. Ukraine is our most important partner. Let me remind you of that fact. With no other country in the world do we have a, such a significant partnership as the one we have with Ukraine, a country to which we have sent 20 billion euros since the Russian invasion of Crimea. And that was a... Very serious act of aggression. Uh, so we have to use that facility for these very extreme sort of situations, very dramatic situations. Should we stop helping them militarily? And it, that would make it even more difficult for them to resist this act of aggression, this invasion. Now Mali. Mali. I understand your concerns. I had something here. I've lost it now. I had something very concrete here, but I've lost it, sorry. With Mali, we've had a series of meetings. We've been in constant contact on how to deal with a situation that has arisen or since the French military has abandoned the nation. We have asked for guarantees. We've asked for guarantees from the Mali authorities that the training that we do of their troops can continue without these troops being used by those Russian mercenaries that have all of a sudden set themselves up there. I'm going to continue in French. I'll ask the, the Mali foreign affairs minister uh, of some guarantees in a very recent letter that I shared with the member states before I sent it. And we received a reply very recently on the 23rd of March. Uh, the Mali government confirms that it wants to maintain its cooperation with us and it wants to respect the agreements in force. But there's a great deal of ambiguity still there on the Wagner presence. And we still have not received the necessary guarantees in order to enable us to continue. So in the April Council, we're going to talk to the minister again. Apparently, well, it's going to be inevitable to uh, uh, suspend our mission, uh, suspend the military training there, and we could relaunch it if necessary. I don't want our mission to disappear, to close its doors. For that, we would need unanimity, of course. So what we will do is lessen uh, our very sensitive training of uh, the troops in Mali, but we will uh, retain a political standpoint. We will continue to provide aid, humanitarian aid, in the context of the conflict. And the other aspects of the mission that we have there. So there will continue to be a presence. There will continue to be dialogue when it comes to governance. And I'm going to also suggest to the minister that we recalibrate our operations there, uh, the more sensitive and delicate ones. Mr. Galler, I think I've more or less responded to the European Peace Facility in relation to Ukraine. We have already surpassed the first block of 500 million euros to a great degree, and we are now looking at the second tranche, the second block, until we get to the billion euros in military aid. And that is being channeled through logistic hubs on the border with Ukraine. I'm not going to tell you where, obviously. 
but things are proceeding well. They're being well channeled, these funds. And I think that this military aid is proving to be very efficient. Somebody told me not today, of course, but somebody told me that well, the military side of things is not having any impact. I don't think that's true. I think that we are having an impact. Our anti-tank weapons and the anti-aircraft ones that we've provided, Ukraine has been effective because without it, there would be many more losses. I think that things are going well. We're not going to increase what we are providing by way of aid, but it's proving to be efficient. Russian, Mr. Galler, is not a problem. Perhaps I haven't expressed myself properly, but the Iranian minister visited Moscow and Russia lifted its objections. And it's no longer a problem. The problem now is to qualify as terrorist organization some of the Iranian bodies. That's got nothing to do with the nuclear pact, but it's a collateral element of said pact, and we haven't been able to solve that issue yet. Uh, my teams are shuttling between uh, Tehran, uh, Vienna, Washington, trying to find a solution, and sometimes they think they're almost there and other days not. It would be a shame not to reach some sort of an agreement when we're so near to reaching one, but I cannot guarantee that we will reach an agreement. What I can guarantee is that Russia has ceased being a problem, and that's an important step forward. A conference on... Uh pero creo que será muy necesario. Pero para eso tendríamos primero que llegar a un acuerdo con el GCPOA. Si no hay acuerdo con el GCPOA, es utópico pensar en cualquier otra cosa. I'm sorry, the microphone switched itself off. I'm sorry about that. I apologize. As regards uh, the summit with China, Picula. Well, when I live here, I will uh, go into preparations on that summit. I'm going to talk, uh, have preparatory talks tomorrow with the Chinese minister. I'm not going to tell you, but I'm going to tell him tomorrow what I'm going to hear from him. Preparations for a summit such as this uh, require a degree of discretion. I can give you my views, of course, if you like, but I would prefer not to do that at the moment, to keep it for another time. The role of China and its relations with Russia is something key in the new geopolitical situation that we have now because of this war. We don't want to push Russia to China and create this huge area, uh, the largest, the most populated together with India, of course, in the world uh, and the southeast of Asia, we could call it the Global South and the plus Global East, and that would be the end of globalization as we've had it to date. But these talks will be very important indeed. And as you can imagine, we are going to stress the fact that China should not cooperate with Russia in its warmongering efforts in Ukraine. But China has its links, its political commitments, it's got its alliances. So this summit is going to be extremely important. I don't think that the decision-making procedures in the Council will change. I don't think that will occur in the Council or Council or the European Council. You saw how difficult it was to reach an agreement on energy, which was affecting Spain and Portugal in the main. As regards Bosnia, Hilde. And, uh, well, you want a European army. Well, that's not something that we will have from one day to the next. Uh, let's proceed step by step. And let's try and develop uh, defense capacity, the summit with Asia. I want to be discreet on that one, too. How many of you are... How many of you follow 
the web page of the External Action Services,、uh, where it puts every day the result of its work on disinformation. How much time do you spend looking at that web site, at that web page? So we're doing, we're dealing with disinformation. We're dealing with disinformation. So have a look at that web page. Oh, good. Thank you. There's one at least here. Sometimes I get the impression that、uh, what we do is something that you're not aware of. Perhaps we don't explain ourselves clearly. Well, Bosnia Herzegovina. Well, we haven't、uh, had an agreement, but the European Council decided that we needed to insist. You know that、uh, there are two problems in Bosnia Herzegovina. First of all, the neo-separatist tendencies in the,、uh, because of Mr. Dudic. All this is more or less under control at the moment, and then there are fundamental disagreements between Croats and Bosnians in the Federation on how to organize electoral and constitutional reform. So we're going to have to continue to work on this because we haven't yet managed to reach, make them reach some sort of agreement. I don't think we'll have 12 million refugees. But well, we have to continue to do what we are doing at the moment.、Uh, we are under an obligation to do that, and I'd like to thank countries like Poland、uh, for the way they are dealing with these refugees, and Germany too. And the Commission has mobilized 500 million euros in order to provide aid to these countries, and we're going to have to continue to provide aid and help, depending on how things develop. We don't want to make more Ukrainians flee from their countries, but that's one of Putin's tactics. Putin uses the exile of millions of Ukrainians as an instrument,、uh, an offensive instrument of his. It's part of his offensive strategy. And the only thing we can do is what we've been doing: apply the pro temporary protection directive, which is foreseen for this sort of situation, and use and depend on the solidarity of states and public entities. The conference on the future of Europe has it got something to say? Well, yes, it's got something to say. And it should say it. This conference can ask itself how to manage. The European Union's foreign policy. It's the European institutions and the member states that have to execute foreign policy and take the necessary decisions. I think that the, the Lisbon Treaty response to that was a sophisticated one, but the obstacle. Is that it requires unanimity? That's still an obstacle. It requires coordination between the Commission and the Council. And the high representative has to deal with that. And then Manu Pineda, I don't share the same views as you. I don't think that we're putting the European Union to, at the service of dark or interests. We're supporting a country that has、uh, suffered an unjustified、uh, act of aggression. Sanctions、uh, impoverish the population, and as Russia says, it provokes an increase in the price of energy, electricity, and foodstuffs worldwide. No, what provokes that is war, not sanctions. Sanctions、uh, devalue the ruble, and that means that this affects the entire Russian population. And、uh, the same would be true; it would affect us if the euro were to be devalued. Well, yes, of course. When you devalue the currency of a country, that affects its population. Please don't laugh about、uh, lowering the temperature. It's not the solution, but it's.、Uh, A part of the solution. There are many people that are suffering energy poverty today, and they cannot reduce their heating temperature because they don't even have heating. So, of course, I'm not addressing that、uh, to them.、Uh, we need social support measures to accompany this in order to combat energy poverty. But developed societies, such as ours, in moments of crisis such as this,、uh, must. Uh, uh, 
made proof of austerity and lower consumption. The French candidate, the green candidate for the French presidency, Mr. Jeannot, says it every day. And every day in the newspapers, you will find articles from economists throughout the world that say that citizens can also contribute to a reduction in energy consumption, especially when this is fed through geopolitical dependence. We have to free ourselves from this geopolitical dependency. We have to reduce consumption, energy consumption. Every little bit helps. I'm sure that lots of people can reduce their energy consumption without putting their welfare at stake. One degree, that represents 7% reduction in consumption. It's not the ultimate solution, but please don't uh, make a caricature of this. There is a school of thought that laughs at that. But Mr. Janot, a serious candidate to the presidency, does defend that argument. And I think his arguments carry weight. Let's not send arms in order to not prolong the war. Think about that, really. Let's not send arms so that we don't prolong the war. So how is the war going to end? How is the war going to end? Because, well, that's the thing. We've got to put an end to the war. I don't just uh, send arms. Uh, uh, we also have to uh, deploy diplomatic efforts to put an end to this war without calling into question the sovereignty of Ukraine. Because the war could end tomorrow if uh, uh, with an arms solution, but that's not what you're proposing. Thank you. Thank you to Zeparel.